Good morning. Good morning, everybody. I am so excited to be over here at DevNet Create. And why am I excited? I'm excited because we have an amazing lineup of speakers, workshops, Camp Create, coding sessions, all here for all of you. I'm also excited because of all of you who have come to attend, both in person as well as those watching on the live stream. And the reason that that's so important is because all of you have chosen to be here, have chosen to learn, have chosen to code, have chosen to meet and become part of this community. And I want to let you know that you made the right choice. Uh, we have some of you here from Nigeria. We have some of you, yes. <laughs> We have people here from the Ukraine. We have people We have people here from Costa Rica. <laughs> we have people here from the San Francisco Bay Area. <laughs> we have students here from Holberton and many other universities. And so all of you have chosen to be here and you are all part of our community. Now, last year at DevNet Create, what we did was we talked about the changing boundaries between applications and infrastructure. And we'll be talking more about that today. And in addition, what we're going to be talking about is our theme of connect to create. So if we take a look at what have we been developing over the last 25 years, is we have collectively created a world of connection. Everything is connected. The internet was founded, the World Wide Web. And as we've connected everything around the world, we've formed entirely new business models, generated entirely new economies, and created amazing experiences that have changed people's lives. But the thing that's changed in this next generation is all of you. It's all of our developers. It's the fact that we can all connect to create. It's no longer just about connecting things. Now it's about what we, as a team, as an ecosystem, how we can work together to create, once again, entirely new user experiences, entirely new business models, and really changing people's lives. So what happens when you take the world's leader in connecting and providing infrastructure? What happens when you take the leading cloud developers? What happens when you take our smartest entrepreneurs and software developers, then you can start to put together connection, connecting things, connecting cities, together with artificial intelligence and machine learning. And once again, we get to a whole new level of innovation. Along with our ability to connect, to create, is that we've earned the right and the privilege to be able to innovate. And along with that comes a responsibility, which is that we also need to protect. So as more and more things become online, as more and more services come online, we need to connect and protect to create. And the thing is that that's a lot of responsibility for an app developer. You know, how does an app developer protect their applications, protect their users, protect their data? And what we want to talk about is also the fact that the infrastructure can help you. You're not alone. We can build in security and protection from the infrastructure itself that all of you can use. Now, what I want to do is take a moment to do an analogy about the ecosystem and about teamwork. An amazing thing has happened in the last month, which is that the US Olympic women's hockey team won the gold medal in women's ice hockey. <laughs> they beat Team Canada to get the gold medal for the first time in 20 years. And I'm sorry, we have a couple Canadians in the room. Uh, and the thing to think about is, look at this, look at these women. Imagine all of the practice that went into developing their skills to be able to carry that puck down the ice, to be able to face world-class competition, to be able to excel, to be able to score, and then to win an Olympic gold medal. And imagine all that practice that all of you as developers put into your lives as well. But imagine when you're doing it alone, or imagine what you can do when you have teammates to help. You can do even more, and going in as two 
to take that puck away and to do your thing, you can do so much more. And then imagine how you feel when you're driving down the ice and you have teammates who have your back. The level of confidence that you can go forward in is an entirely new thing. And so these women have worked together to earn their gold medals, and that is the ultimate competition. And you can just feel the joy from all the hard work, from how they learned to work as a team. You can just feel how and imagine how they must have felt at that moment. And the reason I mention this to all of you is because it is my firm belief that your career is a team sport. This level of joy is not just for world-class athletes. It's also for world-class developers and those who are learning to get into this field. This is my DevNet team. We feel that same joy as we're working with all of you and providing the developers the resources they need. This is our CEO, Chuck Robbins, who has our back, who supports DevNet and DevNet's growth and the growth of the ecosystem. And what I invite for all of you is to build your skills, to build your teamwork with us. I want you to join Team DevNet. And I don't mean that you all have to come and work for me. <laughs> I mean that we together are the DevNet team, the ecosystem, and what we can all do together is that we can take on that world and make you all successful. So let me tell you just a little bit about DevNet. Our goals for DevNet, is, DevNet is Cisco's developer community. We've been around for four years, and our goals are to help you learn, to learn to use the newest APIs, learn about the newest technologies, learn the coding skills that you need, and that's all advancing every day and every month. We want to help you code so that you can actually get hands-on code and build all the things that you want to build. We want to provide inspiration and we want you to share your inspirations when you have great ideas or you want to know, now that I have these skills, what can I build? How can I change the world? And we want you all to connect. Connect as a community, connect with ourselves, connect with each other. And that's our key for DevNet. And let me share with you the goals that my DevNet team has, because I think it's very relevant to all of you and for you to understand why, what we're trying to do for all of you. So our DevNet mission is one, to drive industry and technology transformation on Cisco platforms. Number two is to make innovation easy so that you can build all the innovations that you want to build with our platforms and APIs. And the third is perhaps most important, and this is written down, this is our team's goals, it's to make all of you, to make our DevNet developers successful in your businesses and in your careers. Those are our goals. And when we put on events like DevNet Create, my team and I are dedicated to making all of you successful in your businesses and in your careers. So when we started DevNet four years ago, then what we had was Cisco. And at Cisco, we have Cisco Live. Cisco has an amazing ecosystem of partners and customers around the world. Everybody's using Cisco equipment to build out their networks. We have partners who are doing the installation, the operations, putting services on top of this entire connected fabric that we've all built. And then we had a goal to like say, maybe we could have a developer conference at Cisco Live. We knew that there was a trend going on in the industry where software-defined networking was coming to but we knew that there was a world of network operators and infrastructure professionals who are out there working in the way that they'd been working. We didn't know if they'd be ready for APIs and software. So we just put our faith into it. We held our first DevNet zone within Cisco Live, and this is what happened. We couldn't believe it. We knew it was important for people, but the attendees themselves discovered this and felt that it was important to them. And since then, Four years later, we've now held DevNet developer conferences at every Cisco Live around the world. And we have this community that's built its skills. These are people who are running, operating, selling infrastructure around the world, who are picking up the software skills, and now will be opening up their APIs to the world. And the whole thing about this is that we said, OK, now that the infrastructure is ready, we think that this is a great platform for application developers. 
And that led us to have, oh, and I'm sorry, this community group. So this community has grown now to 480,000 registered DevNet members from over 33,000 different companies, more than 60,000 active monthly users. And what we wanted to do was take this to that next level and then bring this amazing asset to application developers, cloud developers, IoT developers, DevOps professionals, and we formed DevNet Create. Last year was our first DevNet Create. We got feedback that it was great, that it was valuable, and I'm happy to present our second DevNet Create. And number two is a very special number to me because I play hockey, and that's my number. <laughs> and why is two important? Because the first time we do something, what we're doing is we're trying something out. We think it's a good idea. We're hoping it'll stick. We need feedback. Are people really interested? We got feedback from our first DevNet Create. Out of the people who responded, 100% of them said, the technology that I learned about is modern and relevant to my career. 100% of them said, I will come back again. And I couldn't believe it. I kept asking my team as more feedback forms came in, is it still 100%? Because it just takes one to say no, and you're not at 100%. It stayed 100%. Everybody said they wanted to come back. So this is our second DevNet Create. So now let's go back and talk about the industry transformation that's going on of where applications meet infrastructure. And as we said, traditionally, these worlds have been separate. The app developers are building the apps. The infrastructure developers are running the infrastructure. But something has changed over the last few years, which is the entire world of cloud. And as you have cloud applications that are being built on cloud infrastructures, have come the practices of DevOps. Continuous integration, continuous delivery, how can we quickly deploy new applications across a cloud infrastructure, and lives have changed because of this. But things are changing again, which is that infrastructure is now becoming a programmable infrastructure. That infrastructure has APIs. Modern applications can work with this, entire, with this infrastructure in entirely new ways. And this is the theme of DevNet Create. And beyond this, we also have more specifically the fact that the network is programmable, that there's actually network APIs that modern applications can use, and there's a new area of net DevOps that comes into play, where you're using software principles as in DevOps to manage not only your compute, but also your network resources. And there's so much that can happen with applications in this space. Now what I'm gonna do next is show you a simple video of uh, an application that shows how does the network having APIs impact user experiences with the network. It's a bright new day. New password generated. Cheers. Enable guest Wi-Fi. Success. Enable and guest Wi-Fi. What's the password? The password for MLife guest is happy days. Guest Wi-Fi disabled. Success. Disabled guest Wi-Fi. I know that's a really simple application, but there's everyday application to that. You know, how do you get your Wi-Fi configured? How do you turn on your guest Wi-Fi? What's the password again? Right, so this has tremendous impact. And then developers 
are able to build on top of that to combine, to combine technologies from the ecosystem to provide simple user experiences to make networking better. But let's look at other reasons why network APIs are important to developers. So why do infrastructure developers care about network APIs? Infrastructure developers care because they need automation. That underlying infrastructure is complex. It's hard to manage. It's big. And it's getting bigger as we put more and more things onto the internet, as we're hosting more and more important data, and we host more and more users and mission-critical applications. So automation is key. The other thing that's really important is to get observability and insights from that infrastructure so you can make better business decisions and help your applications perform better. It's about security. Infrastructure developers are responsible for having a secure infrastructure, and having network APIs that help you provide that are key. And it's about practices like DevOps and NetDevOps, which let you use software coding tools to manage your infrastructure and your resources and make them available to developers. Now, why do application developers care about network APIs? They care because app developers are writing cloud applications, hybrid cloud applications, multi-cloud applications, and all of these rely on that underlying infrastructure. There's a new definition of infrastructure, which is a digitized infrastructure, where you're bringing new things onto the network, where buildings are becoming digitized, where smart cities are being digitized. And that provides an entirely new opportunity for developers. Application performance is more and more dependent upon the network itself. And to make sure that your application performs well requires an understanding and an ability to leverage what's available with the network itself. In security, as we talked about, app developers have a tremendous responsibility to secure their apps, their users, their data, and the infrastructure can help. Now let me show you a video of some how infrastructure and applications can come together to change lives when we're talking about a digitized infrastructure. Here what we're going to look at is, for example, buildings coming online. Things like badging systems, HVAC, automation for automated elevators, vending machines. You have another set of security cameras, sensors, manufacturing lines, all important. And as all of these things become digitized, imagine what application developers can build. And what we have next is an example of a city, a city in Braga, Portugal, who wanted to revolution and update their transportation system. It's an old city, but they want to have a modern experience within their city. This is a story of innovation. A story of how IBM, Cisco, and the historic city of Braga, Portugal, use the Internet of Things to improve transportation for the people. And how Cisco DevNet is helping make Braga a smart city. I think that the biggest problem was the lack of connectivity between the, the users of the public transportation system. We are providing Wi-Fi use uh, of uh, internet in the buses. The first time that we actually got information out of a serial port in hexadecimal through the iOS environment, did the first parsing of it through the, uh, in, in the iOS itself, converted it into a JSON uh, package and uploaded it to the Watson IoT platform, I think this is pretty cool. The main thing that it's more interesting about this, it allows us to link the present, the past, and then think about the future. As you can see, applications are different. There's a whole other set of applications that developers can build to transform lives. And DevNet Create is about enabling all of you to contribute into this ecosystem, into these experiences, 
and to create new businesses that support all of this. So let's take a quick look at how software applications are built. And here's a, def here's a framework for software where there's an infrastructure of some sort which is now connecting more and more things. And we have data and information that comes together. We have the whole world of analytics and services that is built on top of this and applications that bring all of this together for users. Now let's take a look at the world of cloud development and specifically hybrid cloud development where you want to use the best resources that are available in the cloud as well as combining that with on-premise data, with company data, with cities and infrastructures. So as you have some of this, let's take a look at hybrid cloud applications themselves. Now what you have is a hybrid cloud infrastructure. You have both on-prem data and cloud data. You have analytics and services built on top of those and a set of hybrid cloud applications that need to run. And so as we take a look at this world, Cisco has started a partnership together with Google so that we could bring together cloud development that Google is very much known for, as well as Cisco's great infrastructure, and bring the innovation of these two companies together to provide even more resources for our developers for this new world ahead. And instead of me just telling you about this alone, what we've done is that we have invited Alan Nime from Google He's the head of a product management for Google Kubernetes Engine, and we're going to talk to you together about hybrid cloud. Welcome, Alan. Thank you. Thank you. Great. So welcome to DevNet Create. Yeah, thanks for having me here. So uh, Alan, what we want to do is talk to our audience. And tell us a little bit. Obviously, Google has been a leader in cloud development. And the way that you've been developing your cloud applications itself has changed over the last few years. So why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Right. So over the last three years, um, with the popularization of containers especially, you, you probably, as developers, heard quite a bit about the term cloud native. And Google's been in the cloud native actually for over a decade. And, and cloud native has enabled Google really to redefine our operating model around how we build, run, and manage data centers. Um, it's given us an ability to scale our services tremendously. Now, if I rewind 10 years ago, or 12 years, let's say, um, things weren't always like this, right? Our services were having difficulty scaling. Um, you know, we were trying to add infrastructure to various services that were like really, really driving mass adoption. So we went off to solve two very discrete problems. Number one is, how do we take a workload and package it up and deploy it onto a machine? And then how do we take the same machine and be able to run a variety of workloads? Number two, how do we now take that machine and attach it to a broader set of compute, a cluster, right? So we're not having to worry about where applications are running. And, and ultimately, that was uh, really how we developed this internal system called Borg, which was um, a way for us to really standardize around every service that's running at Google to be containerized and have an automated way of running and managing these containers across our fleet of infrastructure that's running globally. Now, when we talk about cloud native, right, we define cloud native using three things. Number one is container packaged. Right? Containers solve a very important problem. They make deployments more predictable. They make it easier to take an application, package it up with all the dependencies, and deploy it onto a machine. Number two, there needs to be something involved in the scheduling that's smarter than we are in some ways, right? Understands resourcing, understands health checking, understands where to place your applications, right? And this is where the orchestrator comes in, and that was Borg. And then the third area that defines cloud native is microservice architecture, right? It's microservices have given Google the ability to take the monolith, break it up into pieces, be able to scale our teams around services, be able to really drive agility across our developer community as well. So based on all these various best practices that Google had over the last 10 years, 
we developed this open source project called Kubernetes. And uh, in 2014, we open sourced it. And Kubernetes is based on all the wonderful best practices around how Google manages and runs containers, but based on today's requirements versus what Google's requirements were 10 years ago. Um, so it's been tremendous. The uptick has been great. Um, developers are telling us that they are able, what used to once take days in terms of pushing changes into production and, and running applications on infrastructure that's typically operating at 10% efficiency, now they're able to roll in, in various ways hundreds of changes in, in the production nightly and get efficiencies as high as 30 to 40% depending on the nature of the application. So exciting times. It's amazing and just the impact that Kubernetes has had. We build our own development and changed it so that we're using Kubernetes, containers, microservices. It's a big change, but provides entirely new working models. Yes. Um, so now that we have this whole world of containers and cloud development, we have the world of hybrid cloud and our world of developers. Uh, Google and Cisco have come together. So can you just tell us a little bit about why Google and Cisco are working together on hybrid cloud development and what that means? Absolutely. So hybrid is real, but hybrid is hard. And uh, many people, many organizations over the years have tried hybrid. And with the advent of Kubernetes and the adoption, the explosive adoption right now that, that we're seeing with uh, cloud native development, we're finding that typical customers have different requirements, right? Within a single organization, right, you have teams that have applications that can go cloud first. You also have teams where applications can't move to the cloud just because of data compliance uh, regulations, right? And you also have teams that are looking at lift and shift and modernizing in the cloud. So we need to figure out a way to solve for all these requirements. What we're also hearing from customers is it's hard to connect from the cloud into the on-prem environment, right? So if I am building a uh, cloud-native mobile app, and I want to connect to a, uh, a system that's sitting in my data center that can't move to the cloud. How do you do that, right? It's, these are, it's not trivial, right? The other challenge that customers face is connecting into the cloud, consuming services from the data center environment into the cloud. Um, again, right, you have to provision VPNs, you have to ensure it's secure. Um, you know, there's cost issues, there's performance. And then finally, Developers want a consistent experience across cloud and, and, and on-prem environment. So these is, this is what we heard from our customers. Now, in parallel, um, Cisco is working with their customers in terms of providing uh, the cloud-native experience so that they can take what they already have and innovate and implement hyperscale adoption and build applications that are cloud-based. And at the same time, Google, uh, with the adoption of Kubernetes, we are looking for ways in terms of being able to support our customers that start their journey on-prem. And this is where Cisco and Google came together to solve across this wide breadth of uh, challenges that customers have today. From a go-to-market standpoint, our go-to-market is very non-overlapping. We actually complement each other in many ways. Um, Cisco uh, provides our customers with a single support model for all their uh, hybrid cloud needs. And then Google brings its expertise around open source um, uh, cloud innovation into the mix, along with Cisco's innovation around networking and security. And it's a win-win for the customer. It's a win for Google, and it's a win for Cisco. It's amazing. And we've had a great partnership. And I know that at Cisco, we've learned a lot by partnering with you. Can you talk a little bit about what Google has learned from our partnership? Yeah, we've, we've learned that uh, getting environments up and running on-prem are very complicated. It's very complex. We, you know, we view the world very much um, from our cloud lens, where everything is very automated, API-driven. Um, in the on-prem world, there are challenges around bootstrapping. Uh, there are challenges around bringing, bringing up these environments, connecting these environments, security, um, how do you do support, 
Um, these, these were all very key learnings for Google as we were uh, working together in this relationship. We were very much working engineer to engineer and solving some of these key problems along the way. Excellent. Um, now, you know, one thing is that, you know, as we've been working together in different areas and as we've been having our discussions, uh, something that our developers care a lot about is about operations and DevOps. And uh, we're talking, you know, going back to your kind of internal Google development, you've come to an interesting model for operations. You yeah. want to talk a little bit about that? I think our developers would be interested. Sure. So I'm a big fan of DevOps. However, uh, DevOps many times could be a double-edged sword, right? On one hand, you have your, your developers that need to master a language that drives business value, but at the same time, you're giving them this other language for deploying applications and troubleshooting and things of that nature. It's not the most efficient process. So at Google, we actually um, implemented what we call as separation of concerns um, across our operations team. So for example, developers only focus on writing code. Now, we created this new role called an application ops, right? And an application ops person, their role starts where a developer role ends. So as a developer, I write my code and I hand it off to the application ops person who understands how to run the application, how to scale it, what are the requirements, where are the SLOs, SLAs, quality of service that needs to meet, and so on. And basically all that is defined using metadata, right? Now the application ops person takes this package and then hands it off to what's called a cluster ops person. And the cluster ops team is the team that manages the infrastructure. So the application ops role ends where the cluster ops role begins. So what this has enabled us to do is actually um, the number of jobs submitted at Google has grown 10x faster than our ops team, right? So we've been able to substantially increase the number of pushes, the number of changes, the number of applications we're putting in production, but keep our ops team small in size. And it's something that comes up a lot that customers ask and, and want to understand, you know, how does Google do it and how can we implement processes that enable us to do that? Very important area and, and one of the big benefits also of applying microservice architecture is the, the, the notion of reusability, the notion of specialization and so forth. Excellent. And what I want to do in the last minute that we have here is that there's a set of developer tools that we're working on together, so something called Istio. And Google, Cisco, the broader community is working on this. So can you just tell us a little bit about Istio and what we'll do for developers? Yeah. So um, let me first start by uh, defining what, what Istio is. So um, Google, IBM, and Lyft came together um, a little over uh, 18 months ago and uh, created this open source project called Istio. And think of Istio as a, uh, a networking tool that enables you to connect microservices together, right? So Kubernetes enables you to build microservices faster and, and, and build them pretty much anywhere Kubernetes is running, right? So now, all of a sudden, you've got a lot of microservices. Well, how do you connect these microservices together, especially if they're running in heterogeneous environments, different clouds, hybrid, and so forth? Um, how do you do traffic management across these microservices at a layer seven level, right? How do you do canary versioning across hundreds of microservices? Uh, what about telemetry and introspectability? Which microservices depend on each other? What, what is the actual relationship? And I want to and I want to know operations wise, you know, traffic-wise latencies across all these various microservices. That's what Istio solves. Istio, think of it as a control plane, which uh, the control plane and a data plane, the control plane focuses on things like traffic management, authorization, uh, canary deployments. And then you have your data plane, which is an, an Envoy um, sidecar container. Um, Envoy is a project that uh, Lyft has developed. It's bulletproof. Um, they're processing two million uh, requests a second. So it's, it's 
is tried, tested. So we've come together uh, to really introduce Istio in, as an open source project. Um, we're really excited about the investments that Cisco has made in the community around Istio. I believe you have 18 or so uh, contributors to the project. So it's pretty exciting to see uh, how this is going to result. Um, the work that we're doing together on our partnership around some of the use cases that we're enabling will have both a Kubernetes component as well as an Istio component. And I will leave it off um, with this. One of the biggest complaints I hear uh, from Google developers that actually leave Google is um, they miss a lot of the tooling that they took for granted while at Google. Um, when you're building an application, you get so much fabric, so much services for your application without having to think about writing any code. So when they leave Google, they're like, hmm, how do I now do like uh, traffic management? How do I expose my services and, and figure out telemetry? And the whole notion here is with Kubernetes and Istio as a developer, you don't have to write any code to, to enable these features. They're all built in to the platform that you're consuming the APIs that you're leveraging. And that's the beauty here. And I think we're, um, you know, we're, we're at the cusp of some amazing um, opportunity here in, in the market where I haven't seen this level of adoption for, for many years and it's exciting to see how this is all transpiring. It's fantastic. So it's great that you know, with Google you've been sharing the development that you've gone through as you've hit a lot of these problems first and we're working together to provide the community with tools so that they don't have to figure it all out from scratch. Yes. So great, thank you so much, Alex. All right, thank you. <laughs>So Alan just talked about cloud development, what it means as we expand to hybrid cloud development, and that interplay that happens between applications and infrastructure. What I want to talk about next is to once again look at the software framework, but now look at what does this mean in the world of applications where we're talking about a digitized infrastructure. Applications are changing. We just talked about cloud development, but applications are also changing as we bring together the connection where applications are connecting people and places, where they can use indoor location, proximity, they can use the network for identifying identity, roles, access, using location and access analytics on top of that. And in addition, as more things come on board, then applications are covering cameras, IoT devices, sensors, and all of the analytics that's done on top of those. And we have entirely new user interfaces for this as we bring together paradigms like bots and others. So what I would like to do now is uh, talk about Cisco Meraki. We have Raj Krishna, who's the Vice President and, of Product Management for Cisco Meraki, to join us. Raj. Thank you, Raj. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure. So we have quite a lot of Meraki here at DevNet Create. Yeah, absolutely. One of the biggest <laughs> boots, I believe. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Um, so you've been with uh, Meraki for a long time. Seven years. Seven years. And as, we've been, as you've been building out Meraki, something that's been really important to you is the APIs, treating this as a platform and the developer ecosystem. Yeah. Can you tell our audience a little bit about what that means for Meraki? Yeah, absolutely. So Meraki is a, is a cloud-managed networking platform. We make routers, switches, wireless access points. And what we found uh, through the years is we kind of were born in the cloud. We were the first to build cloud-networked endpoints. And that made the management of these, of these devices at scale seamless and, and highly scalable and highly effective. But over the years, what we found was we're getting requests from partners and even from customers who are saying, hey, can you expose some of this data to us? Can you allow us to orchestrate the network perhaps externally from the cloud management? The cloud management is great and it, and it is very, very effective, but we want to mix and match data from different applications. We want to script some of the automation services of actually scaling out and rolling out 1,000 wireless access points or 10,000 wireless access points. 
So a few years ago, uh, we made a concerted bet to start investing in this API ecosystem. And, and over the last several years, we've actually built out a very rich set of APIs. And these APIs have enabled all kinds of very interesting and innovative applications built on top of the network infrastructure layer. We've seen, we've seen all various different kinds of applications ranging from seamless provisioning. We have service providers that are, for example, integrating network access products into their web store. I can go to their web store, and I can buy, let's say, a wireless access point, and then a three-year connection. And as soon as I hit click, that actually initiates a series of API calls that provision those products automatically. So that's just one example of just a wide range of very cool and interesting applications that we've seen. And as a result, we've been he investing heavily in this ecosystem. We believe that there's going to be a new generation of startups and companies that are going to be formed building intelligent applications on top of network infrastructures and on top of network platforms. So that's, kind of, that's been an interesting trend to watch and to kind of ride that wave. And we believe that the, the entire market is just getting started. So I think the, the, the best and the most exciting is, is still ahead of us. And it's interesting because many people look at their wireless access points in order to get wireless connectivity, but they can get things like location, proximity, all sorts of new things on top of that as well. So there's so much more that even app developers can do with these APIs. Yes. Um, can you tell us about some of the cool things that your developer ecosystem has built using your APIs? Yeah, absolutely. So we're, we're engaged in all kinds of very interesting large-scale rollouts as well as some very interesting pilots that we're seeing. So we're seeing everything across the board from large-scale Cisco partners like Worldwide Technologies who are actually building a customized managed service on top of Meraki to do things like customer engagement using splash portals and data collection as well as seamless provisioning. So we're seeing partners craft new services as a way to differentiate and, and um, add more services revenue on top of Meraki. But we're also seeing end customers themselves start to hire more developers so that they can do things like data aggregation by extracting data outside of Meraki and aggregating it in something like Splunk for external visualization. We're seeing um, interesting uh, use cases in hospitality, where we have a large hotel chain that's deploying Meraki, and they're using beacons in their food carts to actually track the location of those food carts as they move throughout the property. So there's, there's an entire range of use cases, and we've even heard of stories uh, where companies are building applications on top of the infrastructure, and then they're adding so much value that they're being acquired by other businesses. So a good example comes to mind, Cloudessa. Cloudessa, throughout the course of several years, built a number of authentication applications and customer engagement applications, and they were adding so much value that another company called Global Reach, a global advertising company, actually acquired them. So great examples of just how there's going to be this this new ecosystem of partners as well as customers that's going to be building customized applications that are going to be generating billions of dollars in value and revenue. That's excellent. And as many of these developers, they've really been partnering with you for the long haul. And uh, you've created, again, new businesses like the example that you gave. But do you have other examples of how you've actually brought along software developers like all of these and how their businesses have evolved along with Meraki's growth? Yeah, absolutely. So we've been investing not just in the product side, but also in the ecosystem side. So we've, we've been doing things like developer giveaways, where we actually give away Meraki kits. Uh, later today, we're going to be announcing how Meraki's going to be giving away more than a million dollars worth of our switches, including at this conference, so that we can help seed the ecosystem and we can show what's possible on top of a Meraki infrastructure. Actually, you just made the announcement right there. <laughs> Absolutely. So we're going to be giving away um, a, a ton of Meraki switches. Uh, the, the details will be shared later today. You can visit the Meraki booth later uh, in, the, in, in the day. And this is, again, just a way for us to help seed the ecosystem, help provide free gear to developers so that they can experiment. Because honestly, the most cool and innovative applications that we're going to see out there, they don't exist yet. And I'm not going to be the one who's going to dream them up. Maybe, hopefully, I may be able to think of some cool ideas. But I think the people in this audience are the ones who are going to be able to put two and two together based off of your own histories and knowledge and customer contacts and just creativity to build those cool applications on top. So that's just one example of some of the things we do. Another example is we've set up dedicated teams at Meraki to help have these conversations and help fuel this ecosystem. So we have two specialized teams that are brand new. One is a solutions architecture team. And this is a team of solutions architects that actually goes out and has these whiteboarding conversations, makes sample code available, maintains all of our documentation, launches online app stores, and features customized applications as a part of that app store. 
um, and has those technical conversations. That's one team that exists. Another team that exists is a brand new business development management team that we've created. Again, very ecosystem and partner centric, but designed to have more of those business level conversations about what are some of the interesting applications you can build? How do they add value for customers? How can they add incremental services revenue if you're a partner trying to create differentiated services? So we're, we're investing heavily in these teams because we believe in the ecosystem and we want to help seed these ideas. And I've been you know, really encouraged when you see a product team that starts out with a commitment to the ecosystem and to its developers and you know, giving out kit to let people build and create. It's really amazing. Yeah, and we, we see, honestly, we see the entire genesis of APIs um, and programmability to be about a number of things, including building interesting and, and innovative applications, but also for uh, more kind of specific use cases. Let me give you a couple of examples. One is security. So we recently uh, released a number of APIs for our mobile device management product. So one of our software suites lets you manage endpoints, whether it's an iOS device, an Android device, um, a PC, or a tablet. And we released a suite of APIs for this product. So you can do things like pull all the attributes of the device, including whether the device is jailbroken, whether it's running disk encryption, whether it's running certain applications. And you can use that information to then make another API call to write some kind of a network policy to say, change the network posture of this device, or wipe this device completely, or change the profile of the device so that I remove all my sensitive corporate applications. So that's just one example of how we're trying to actually be very, very privacy-centric, because in this new day and age, the more data you make available, the more careful you want people to be, and, and the more you want to treat that data appropriately within the vein of privacy. So that's also why in the context of an upcoming set of European privacy laws, GDPR, we've actually been working on a new set of APIs that will, for example, let you wipe the data belonging to a particular client. So Europe's right to be forgotten um, is a very, very important law, right? Because privacy is a fundamental human right. And that's why we believe that if we really want to enable privacy at scale, what better way than APIs, right? And you can imagine now web developers at, at customers and partners building privacy-centric applications to say, show me what data you have about me, and then click, I want to wipe all that data that you have about me, right? So it's not just about cool and interesting applications. It's also about some very fundamental network end objectives and privacy end objectives. That's fantastic. Oh. <laughs> so it's not only about connect to create. It's about connect and protect to yeah. create. And you're building it right in. Yeah, I like that a lot. So Raj, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Susan. <laughs>
And it revolves around our Cisco Kinetic platform. So this is a new IoT platform that Cisco has. And it has three pillars to it. The first is around extracting data. And then there's one around computing data, and that's specifically around edge compute. And then moving data, getting that data to the places where you need to take the actions that need to happen. And we're going to focus on the edge and fog compute module and show you some of that. Edge compute is something that we've been talking with our community a lot about, because it's a new thing for developers to think about, to decide why would you do a compute at the edge? When should you do a compute at the edge? If you're going to do it, how do you architect your applications to take advantage of compute at the edge? And so I invited Casey, uh, our evangelist for IoT, and he's going to walk through some examples that show why uh, compute at the edge is important and um, how Kinetic fit, fits into Excellent. that. So, Thank awesome. you very much, Mandy. Go for it. All right. So if we look at IoT applications, one of the biggest issues we have today is that devices have to choose where to send their data to, and they have to make decisions about what applications are going to actually use and consume that data at each time. So we have to get the right data to the right place at the right time. And really, that's application logic. That's business logic that application developers need to write. And the problem is, is that these applications and devices are heavily distributed. So at Cisco, we said, what else is distributed? Well, we have compute distributed throughout the network platform. What is it that application developers like to write in, or, or how can we easily deploy code? And you guys heard it all morning, it's containers, right? So we said, what if we could actually allow application logic in containers to be deployed to the network fabric, to the actual edge, and let your business decisions, your developers, to write code that says, when data meets certain exceptions or conditions, do certain actions. And that's what we're going to show today. We're going to actually show an application running in a container here. And one of the cool things is we're now launching this on all of our catalyst switching lines as well. So a lot of the new infrastructure from Cisco can natively run compute throughout the network fabric. So we've got actually an integrated IR router over here. It's an industrial router. And it's running a container, an application. And in this case, we're actually running a pre-built application from Cisco called Kinetic. And this is a visual UI editor that actually lets me kind of make decisions about where data gets routed. So the UI that you're going to show us, that's actually running it's on It's actually a web router. server running on, okay. in a container on the router. Very cool. Yep. And so this, this application running in the container can collect data from devices. And now the developer can start to make decisions. And there's lots of use cases, like low latency compute operations, where I want to make decisions very, very fast. I don't have time to go to a data center or to a cloud to get a response. Or maybe I want to make decisions about where that data gets routed. So for instance, a fire alarm. When it emits an event that its battery is low, I probably want to alert the local management staff or facilities. But when there's a fire, I probably don't want to let facilities know. I probably want to alert somebody, uh, an emergency responder, right? Yep. So let's take a look at a demo of this. All right. So here I've got the data flow editor from Kinetic. And this is actually, again, the web interface running in this router. And I've got a number of different things here. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to set a value to on. And you'll see that the router actually emitted an event to control these Wi-Fi controlled lights. And I've got a little script down here that's monitoring some data. One of the data points is actually the CPU of the actual router, of the container running in the router. So I can see the CPU live here being generated in that container. And I've got a little script that says when the CPU bumps up, we're going to light a, a different light. We're going to change the direction the data routes. OK. Let's now, see one it. way I can actually bump the CPU of this container up is I can actually just jiggle some elements in the web UI. So <laughs> we're just going to jiggle that. And you can see the data. Oh, there the we CPU go. bumps Let's do up. Do it again. Do it again. I'm going to do it a couple times here. And you can see. OK. All there right. you go. Nice. Nice. All right. But we can actually collect data from things that are even more valuable, right? So I got a question about that. First. Yes. So this is great. Um, I'm thinking about from the developer's perspective. Uh, if I'm going to build something, run it at the edge, I want to know, does it use tools I'm familiar with? What's this actually written in? Like, is it developer friendly for me? It is very developer friendly. In fact, here's the JavaScript that's actually routing that. So I'm making cool. decisions about the data. So this is JavaScript running in that container in the router all at the edge. Very cool. Yep. All right. So what else can we do? All right. So I'm also collecting data from a sensor here. So I actually need a volunteer for this next piece. Yes. Uh, all right. Okay. We got an eager one. <laughs> all right. That was quick. You just, we didn't even have to beg and plead. All right. <laughs> now what you need to do is you need to come over here. All right. Stand right here. All right. OK. And you're just going to hold that out in your hand. And you've got to hold it very still. Very okay? still. Don't, don't move, OK? Now, Keep you don't really have anything to be worried about, but I'm going to put on some protective eyewear. Yeah. 
You're you're fine. Did you bring sunglasses or anything? No. no? Okay. Yes, you're fine. All right. It's good. It's good. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. We're, don't don't look over there. Yeah. It's okay. There okay, we go. Now hold it very still. Okay. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> All right. So, <laughs> so this is actually a gas sensor. Okay. And when it detects gas, it's going to emit an event that's being detected in the router at the edge, and it's going to make some decisions about what it should do. The first thing it's going to do is flash some lights, right? But we actually were talking about smart buildings, and we said, what about somebody who's visually or auditorily impaired? How are we going to let them know to leave the building? So we actually have an IoT-enabled subwoofer down here that's going to emit a pulse to let somebody know, and it's going to pulse SOS in Morse code. So let's go ahead and trigger this Very here. Very cool. So you're letting the gas out. So. Coming. Let's do this again. Yeah. And. Is it going? Let's see here. Maybe you need more gas. I'm breathing. There it goes. Yeah, there we go. There it there goes. Go. <laughs> and the red light's flashing. Yep. So now we are pulsing SOS through the building, so somebody who doesn't hear or can't see can actually know that Feel it's that. time to leave the building. And then when I turn the gas off, the uh, event will stop. So there we go. So cool. we can make decisions at the edge. Thank you very much. Thank awesome. You. Thank, Thank you. Much. Thank you. Thanks so much. All right. Cool. Very cool. OK, uh, next. Yes. Back to there this. OK. So the next demo that we want to show you, thank you for your participation, and, and thanks for checking that out. Uh, the next one we want to dive into is around the connect and protect to create. So this one starts to dive into some of our security platforms. So Cisco has a lot of great security products, and what I get really excited about is that they're also platforms. They have APIs, so I can start to do automation, build applications on top of them, incorporate that security information into my workflow as a developer. We're going to look at um, how some of the world-class intelligence research, uh, threat detection research done by Talos is exposed through APIs, and we're going to walk through a couple use cases of using some of that information. We're also going to use uh, OpenDNS Umbrella, which also exposes APIs that can let you investigate and enforce and do different things to help protect your applications and your network. So we're going to start with um, a very simple and typical security scenario that you might have come up that is a team discovers some kind of suspicious artifact on their network. Maybe it's a file that's acting suspiciously, an IP address they've identified as being suspicious. And then what do they do? You need to form a team together to look at this artifact and determine what's going on. And then you need to start doing research. And typically, teams will use multiple tools. Uh, Threat Grid, Talos, maybe even Virus Total from Google or third party tools, community tools. People want to do research across multiple tools because some are focused more on files, some are better at URLs, and you want to get that confidence and as much information as you can get. And this all just comes back to the team to discuss. So we thought maybe we can use APIs to improve this workflow a little bit. And so what we did is we created um, a security bot. This uses our Cisco Spark platform APIs. And then it also uses the APIs of ThreatGrid, Talos, VirusTotal, and Cisco Umbrella. And what we've done is that the team would now start a team Spark space room. So get together the team together. They can start chatting about the incident, about what they're finding. And then you can add our security bot into that room. And the security bot is written in Python. It runs in the Google Cloud. And that security bot sits in the room and looks for information that's posted to the room that looks like an IP address, a hash for a file, um, or a URL. And then it goes and queries all of those security platforms, brings back that information, puts it right in the room where the team is discussing the incident, and also brings back deeper information that people can click into. So we're going to walk through that and, uh, and show you how that works. We can switch to the computer now. Perfect. All right. So Mandy, I'm here in our Spark Space, which is our collaboration platform. Excellent. And uh, so we've got a team here. We've got a, a number of people here. And we've added the security bot. So maybe we just got some information. Uh, maybe a, a malicious email came in. And uh, we have the source and destination IP addresses of the email. But it also included an attachment. So we can include the, uh, the hash of that file. And we can get some information. So I'm going to paste that information into our, our Spark Space here. And we immediately start getting responses from our security bot that's querying all the different intelligence platforms. Cool. 
So I can see that it, if you scroll up to the artifacts, we can see those IP addresses and then the actual hash. We see it went out and queried Talos, threat grid, and it brings back the threat score so you can tell how serious of an incident this is. And then it brings back actually links to, if you click on like that Talos one, I think you get a link to the actual detailed information on their site. So it just brings all the information, the power of those platforms into the place where the team is working. And we like this because it's interesting to show multiple platforms working together, so collaboration plus security, to solve a problem that hopefully makes someone's workday a little bit more efficient, maybe their weekend a little bit longer, borrowing from one of our speaker's favorite sayings. All right, that's great. Excellent. Thanks so much. And we're back to Susie. Thank you. Thank you, Mandy. Thank you, Casey. Did those demos help? Yeah. Great job, guys. So uh, what I want to do now is talk, and we just did the demo, is to talk now about what's new in DevNet. And there's some things that we're presenting for all of you. So first of all, when we take a look at the DevNet ecosystem, as we said, it's about how we together as an ecosystem come together to connect, to create. And one thing that, we just, that is very critical is understanding the different platforms that are available. As we take those platforms and we expose APIs, then what we're doing is creating with all of you the developer ecosystem. The developer ecosystem of code creators, of people who are consuming code written by all of you and by the community. In addition, what we're doing is reaching up to help you get to business. In addition to the developer ecosystem, there's a business ecosystem that all of you are critical to where people who are writing code are becoming sellers, where those who are consuming code are the buyers. And what we want to do is enable all of you to be active in the business side as well. So what we do is we have offerings in all three layers for all of you. Of course, in the DevNet developer site at developer.cisco.com, we provide you all the basics that you need to get coding and get developing. We have documentation of APIs, learning labs, a developer sandbox, so that you can code applications, like we've been discussing, as easily as you can code a mobile app. We have developer support to get you the help that you need and a place for the community to come together. Now, in addition, as we work up one layer, what we're going to do is actually introduce DevNet Code Exchange. So DevNet Code Exchange is a place where we'll present curated software that's built around Cisco's platforms and APIs. Sample code, connectors, open source, code that's written by all of you, by the community, written in GitHub and built in GitHub, but then making sure to curate it and tell you which of this code is great for all of you to use and for the Cisco ecosystem to use as they're building out their solutions for their customers. And we'll also have a place to connect to expert developers who are all of you who are building and writing this code and getting you connected to our greater ecosystem around the world. In addition, we want to help you in your business. And as you get up to the business side of things, we have DevNet Ecosystem Exchange, which we'll be coming out with in the next month. And in the Ecosystem Exchange, what we're talking about and sharing is applications that have been written that can be used to build out different solutions that we're talking about. It shows the ecosystem partners like the ISVs, the IHVs, who provide solution components into these bigger solutions that will be deployed with various customers. It includes our ecosystem partners like the system integrators who can customize and build solutions for their customers' needs. And what we want to do is in the ecosystem exchange, promote the visibility of the applications that all of you write, and once again, provide a way to get to the broader world uh, of Cisco's customers that are using all of these products. In addition, what I want to tell you about is for a select number of ISVs or software vendors, as you write software, and that software is built on top of our APIs, and it makes sense for our partners to sell this and to sell this around the world. We have a, set, a program called DevNet Solutions Plus, which allows your software to be put onto the Cisco price list, which then allows Cisco's partners and customers to be able to purchase this from around the world. 
and this is going to be set for a number of select software uh, vendors and software applications that are ready for that level of scale. And it's going to be tremendous. And what we're going to do is have a place for you to share with us the applications that you've built and see which ones are ready for this level as well. So that's what we're very excited about, is to not only provide the technology enablement to give you the developer tools and resources that you need, but also a way to have the community share software and code together, and then to enable that business exchange, leveraging the ecosystem that we have built around the world. And now what I want to do is focus in on DevNet Create, and I'm going to have Mandy come up and share what we have for you here at DevNet Create. Thank, Thank you. you, Mandy. All right. So I just wanted to take a few minutes before we get started on the rest of the day to give you a view of some of the activities that are available to you in the conference and give you a couple important things to keep in mind. So the first things that you can take advantage of are our tech talks. They're happening here in this room and also in our classroom. These tech talks are you know, lessons learned, use cases people want to share with you, thoughts around emerging technologies, um, and they cover a great number of topics around DevOps patterns, CI/CD, uh, continuous deployment and, con and integrations of CI/CD pipelines, even for IoT, which I'm excited to see that one. Uh, blockchain, serverless, and also my favorite API design and developer documentation on making developer experience great. So lots of great things to check out there. The next thing you can do is actually start getting hands-on and experimenting with some of the technology that's here. The one thing I want to call out in our mini hacks is the Black Hat Security Challenge. So in this challenge, we brought some consumer IoT devices, and you can actually hack into those, break into a safe, hack into a video camera, retrieve a hat, and then we'll show you how to defend against it. So we've got instructions that walk you through all of that, and anyone can do it, no experience required, uh, but you can make it as challenging as you want. Then workshops. So we heard from you last year that you wanted more of the hands-on workshops. So we've actually doubled the number of workshop stations that we have in the conference. And these are small eight-person workshops you have on headphones. You can bring your laptop and code. We've got instructions to get your laptop set up beforehand. So check that out if, if you um, are planning to code. But you can also stand around and, and sort of spectate. So you can choose your level of involvement with these workshops. And we encourage you to try both. Tons of great um, topics here around IoT, cloud, Kubernetes, microservices, all the things that you've been hearing about throughout this talk. And then the last thing is the community and fun. We really want you to take time to connect with each other. I'd like for everyone to just set a goal of however many people you came already knowing, set that goal to meet that many more, maybe that many more times two even, that you want to connect with and leave with a, a lasting connection from the conference. We have a spark space for the, for the conference that you can connect in. If you go to devnetcreate.io, there's a link, click it, it'll put you right into the spark space. We are going to reconnect in this room at the end of each day for people to come back and talk about what they've learned. We've got some fun giveaways. Um, we'll have opportunity for the audience to have feedback. And then we, oops, wrong way. And then also we have s'mores. So today at our Create After Dark, it's a party out on the patio. We've got food trucks, we've got s'mores and fire pits, and it'll be a really fun place to connect. <clears throat> Camp Create is something else I want to let you guys know about. This is the first year that we've done Camp Create. It's totally new. And it's six teams working on six different use cases, coding for two days. And I invite all of you to code along sort of vicariously with them. Come to the kickoff presentation, hear about the use cases, come to the final presentation, and see what they've built. And then you can also find these people and talk to them. They have on the teal green lanyards. So if you see someone with the teal green lanyards, that means they're part of the Camp Create coders. And the Meraki challenge that, that Raj mentioned. So we are giving away Meraki switches to all developers who want to get hands on with the Meraki gear. We have a pyramid of switches built out in the exhibit floor. You can earn it today by writing some code and take it home with you. Uh, so please stop by that booth, check it out. There's different levels you can of coding challenges that you can try. And we're really excited to get this wonderful Meraki gear into the hands of developers and see what you're going to build with it. 
And design thinking, this is something we've started adding to all of our DevNet events. And we've added it in a way because we think it's an important skill for developers to know, to get familiar with the concepts of design thinking. So we teach those, but we also take them and apply it to a real world problem. So you can go to the workshops and work on a project we're doing with the Opportunity Project and the US government around emotional well-being. And you can also do one that relates to one of the Camp Create use cases. So definitely stop in and check that out. And the ecosystem that Susie was talking about, we're going to have office hours that you can check in and find out more about the opportunities in the ecosystem. And the last thing I want to mention is your actual badge. I should have brought one with me. Um, we wanted to do something a little different with the lanyards and badges this year. We wanted to make them completely reusable. So we, we all leave these conferences. What do you do with your lanyard and badge? So if you'll notice, the lanyard is actually made from paracord. It's made by a small business on Etsy that we're really excited to support. You can unwind that and make something else out of it after the conference. If you make something cool, send us a picture. Um, or if you use it in an actual survival setting to make like snowshoes or something, we definitely want a picture of that. <laughs> um, the other part is the actual clip is reusable. You can take that home and use it for your badge at work. So it comes off and it's reusable. And then the name card is actually wildflower seeds. And you can plant it and water it, and it will grow into wildflower seeds. So your whole badge is reusable. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> And I think that's it. I think oh, over to you. Oh, yeah. So, oh yeah. And most of all, we wanted to give a thank you to all of you, the community, our speakers, our sponsors. You make the conference, and we are so thankful for your time and energy that you've brought to it. We really, really grateful for that. Thank you. Thank you, Mandy. <laughs> So you can see why I'm so excited in terms of what we have with all of you and what we've provided for this exciting next two days ahead of, you, ahead of us. To go back to our analogy at the beginning, we were talking about ice hockey. And I want to give a quote by Wayne Gretzky. So many of you, I'm sure, have heard this, which is, skate to where the puck is going, not to where it has been. And I know many of you are here to learn about the newest technologies, the newest trends, so that you can prepare yourself for your future, for your careers, for your business success. And we are here to help. And in addition, it's about teams. It's about ecosystems. And we invite you to join Team DevNet because we are committed to helping you be successful. And let me put up this other quote by Amy Poehler, which says, find a group of people who challenge and inspire you. Spend a lot of time with them, and it will change your life. And I strongly believe this, and I believe that by working together, we can strongly change the world. And so it's all about Team DevNet, which is not just the people who report to me. It's about all of you, what we can do together to be successful in this next generation ahead. And what I want to do is leave you with what I would like to see from you in the next two days in this conference. So as you saw, in DevNet, we're all about learn, code, inspire, and connect. So I hope over these next two days, you learn the newest technologies. You learn about the APIs. I hope that you code and you get hands-on, because that's what you all wanted to do. And that's what DevNet Create is all about. In addition to that, there's so much more that you can get here. If you come here and just learn and code, that's great. But I think we can come together, and if you look at inspire and connect, what's most important is how you all connect, how you connect with us, how you connect with each other. You'll get much more value out of DevNet Create in the time that you've chosen to invest in being here if you meet each other. I ask you to share your inspirations and your aspirations. Share them with each other. If you share them with me, share them with my team members, share them with each other, the only way that you get help is by letting other people know what you're trying to achieve. So I ask you to come, get out there, meet each other, meet all of us, and have a great time at DevNet Create. Thank you. All right, let's give it up to Raj, Alan, Mandy, Casey, and of course, Susie. Thanks again. All right.
Coming up next here in the theater, we have Damon Edwards, a DevOps, a DevOps guru, who's going to be giving us a great talk. I'm looking forward to it. Um, as Mandy pointed out, there's tons of other stuff for you to do too, but hope you can join us here as well. Thank you.